I think the West is a community of shared values as well as a community of shared interests, and the two go together. The common interests in many respects stem from the common values. And it's no accident that if we go back to the 19th century, the world's democracies, which started off in the Atlantic space, have tended to be on the same side when it comes to major geopolitical disputes. First World War I, then World War II, then the Cold War. And that's because they have come together to defend both a way of life as well as the physical and territorial security uh, uh, of the countries uh, themselves. Uh, and I think the key, the key question that we, that we have before us today is, is that West going to, to hang together? How resilient is it in the face of polarization and in the face of populism? Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a critical question because I think the West has been and needs to continue to be the anchor of a liberal rules-based system. As far as whether there's a new Cold War developing between the illiberal world and the liberal world, uh, I, I, would, I would kind of unpack this question in, in a somewhat different way and say that the first order priority for the Atlantic democracies is getting our own house in order that the, the populism, the illiberalism, the polarization, the distrust in democratic institutions, this is the main threat that we face today. Because if we don't snap back from this slide towards illiberalism and polarization, then there's no way that we are going to deal effectively with external problems whether it's Russia, whether it's China, whether it's development in Africa, we need to have our own lights on if we're going to get our policies right to the external world. And so I think that the, the key debates to start with are the future of work, immigration, fighting economic inequality, promoting socioeconomic integration, in other words, getting the West's momentum and self-confidence back, then we will uh, hopefully be able to go out and deal with, uh, with the outside world. And at, at this point, I don't, I don't think we're in a, in a new Cold War uh, in several respects. One is that we are in a, a globalized economy. During the Cold War, East and West were really separate economic spheres. And that says to me that even if we fragment on security, we will be drawn together uh, on economic issues. Uh, and then the second issue is that there is a, I think, a tug of war uh, between different principles, how to organize society, democracy, non-democracy. But unlike during the Cold War, I don't think that the Chinese, for example, are universalizers. They don't want to go out and turn Americans and Europeans into Confucians. Uh, they want respect. They would like greater sway in their zone in East Asia. So I think we're, we're moving into a world in which there won't be the same kind of ideological class that there was in the Cold War, but in which there will be more diversity, more pluralism, not a world dominated by the West, but not a world dominated by anyone else either. One of the reasons that I would be optimistic about transatlantic resilience is that the relationship is very sticky. Uh, and if you go back to the administration of George W. Bush, things looked pretty rocky during the Iraq War. Uh, there was a fundamental difference of opinion on a key question of war and peace. Well, what happened during Bush's second term? Essentially, the United States and Europe were drawn back together. Uh, out of necessity as much as choice, the two parties remain each other's best partners. Barack Obama came into office to some extent as a post-Atlanticist. He wanted to go out and build new partnerships with emerging countries around the world. He left office a convinced, uh, dedicated Atlanticist. 
And I think that's in part because he realized that when the United States needs help in the world, the best place to look is Europe. When you call the Chinese, when you call the Indians, when you call the Brazilians, they probably will hang up the phone. When you call Brussels or Berlin or Paris or London, you may not get everything you want, but you will get a good faith effort to offer whatever is available. I don't see that changing anytime soon. And I think in some respects that's one of the reasons that President Trump, who started off calling NATO obsolete, who indicated that he might withdraw the United States from NATO, uh, has uh, seemingly backed away from that position uh, and now is welcoming the increased defense spending that's taking place on the European side uh, and I think has realized that in the end of the day, the United States needs its European partners. If the U.S. is going to lighten its load internationally, the best place to look for help is Europe. So uh, in the end of the day, I remain optimistic that this uh, Atlantic relationship is going to main, uh, remain strong, uh, mainly because the two sides of the Atlantic continue to realize that they are each other's best partners. Opinion surveys do show that on both sides of the Atlantic, younger voters care less about traditional geopolitical issues and they care more about climate change and they care more uh, about uh, institutions, human rights, the, what you might call some of the softer issues on the agenda. And I think that's in part because they don't have the same historical memories. And so I do think that it's important for those those of us who, who do come from the older generation to make the case, to appeal to uh, our younger cohorts, uh, to invest in this relationship. I also think it's to some extent easier at a time when illiberalism is on the march, at a time when Americans and Europeans alike can look at Russia, can look at China, can see that the Chinese are making inroads in many parts of Europe, in Africa, Belt and Road is coming, uh, and they can see uh, a different way of life, a different set of values. Uh, and in that respect, they may, they may be more, uh, more likely to say, we need to make sure that the Atlantic space remains the anchor uh, of liberal values in a rule-based order.